as a building performance consultant for people who are building new homes and doing additions and trying to improve older homes, I both do calculations myself to help people kind of optimize their performance and size their HVAC systems. And I also get to see a lot of calculations that people do um, out there and then their clients send to me to have a look at. And what I'd like to show you here is one that I thought was particularly special. Um, it was like the weirdest thing that I had seen that month. And, and I see weird stuff every week. So here is a duct layout. And um, I'm not even going to tell you where this home is based just because I want to protect the anonymity of the person who did this and the, the client of mine whose home this is. But when you look at a heating and cooling design, the first thing that you can do that's a red flag uh, indicator is to look for rooms that don't have a load. These would be interior rooms. They have no exterior exposure at all. This house right here that we're looking at is a big sprawling house. And the thing about big sprawling houses is that they're going to have interior rooms that do not have any exposure to outside. They have a floor that's not exposed to outside. And even if it's a slab on grade, we don't really count it in a manual J software unless the perimeter is exposed to outside. So the fact that it's just sitting on dirt doesn't really hurt the room at all. Um, so this game room right here, for example, you can see uh, is, has no exposure to outside. And all the walls face interior space. The ceiling of this entire house is under a conditioned attic. And so there is no ceiling in this room either. So the fact that there are not one, but two supply registers in that room is a giveaway. The hallway right here also, no exterior exposure has a, a register. This pantry right here has a register. Um, so there's all kinds of little giveaways there. If you just walk into a house and you look and you see that there is a register in a totally interior room, it tells you that they did not follow the recipe, which is spelled out in Manual J. There are reasons that they might have done that, but they need to show their work and they need to like explain themselves and show why they did certain things. So here is the actual calculation portion of what I received from my client. And um, so, so let's just take a look at this. What you can see here is that this is obviously to somebody who has worked in Excel, this is an Excel spreadsheet. The question that you might have is, is this a manual J? Does this count? And the flat out answer is no, this does not count as a manual J. Manual J is a manual that tells you how to do these things. And if you're, if it looks like this, it's probably not. Here's how we can tell. We can start to pour through this thing and do a little bit of math and see what's going on here. Um, and for that, I have a redlined version already up. So you can see right here, the exposed feet of exposed wall, uh, running feet of exposed wall, 434 feet. And what I did is I just took the plan that you saw on that first page there, put it into my 3D modeling software, traced the walls, and came up with a number. 461 is the number I got. 434 numbers they got, eh, they're pretty close. I got 7,100 square feet of uh, conditioned floor space. They got 6,300. Mine is more than theirs. What you'll see in a second is that, they're, um, by the way, sorry, I still have painted nails. I still have two daughters, and I'm still recording this on the same day that I did another video. So um, not trying to get freaky. It's not Halloween. I just love my children. So what uh, we want to look at here is that the ceiling dimension is 12. It is a 12 foot ceiling on the first floor. That's fine. But this number and this number are not the same. See the 75, 70, 65, 76 gross exposed walls and partitions is not any combination of these things added together or, or anything like that. So I'm not sure where that math, like it looks like two separate inputs. Also windows and glass doors, they have grouped east and west windows and northeast and northwest windows into one category. And I think that that's totally insane because you have to remember that manual J is about one hour. If you look at it a certain way, it's about the hottest day of the year at five o'clock in the afternoon. That's what it is. So the west facing windows are way more important than the east facing windows for this equation. And grouping the east and the west together means that I, I have no idea how many west facing windows there are. So this is a problem. Um, also, we've got some math kind of discrepancies here where we've got numbers that aren't adding up. 
If you just start to look at things and you say, okay, how many square feet of ceiling? It should be the same as the square feet of floor. If you're not assuming that there's going to be a conditioned attic, which this guy's not clearly because he's got a duct BTU per hour loss spelled out right here on uh, row 13. I don't know what 10% means, but he's got 14 and a half thousand BTUs. That's more than one ton of cooling that's going to be needed for the fact that we're losing uh, cooling from the ducts. That means that the ducts are not located in conditioned space in this designer's mind. Also, we've got infiltration, which is air leakage, 76,000 BTUs per hour. Um, is, that's half as much as the entire structure is losing. That means all the windows are open at the same time. That's a totally crazy number. I've never even seen anything like that. That's six tons of air, con of air conditioning just needed to handle the air leakage. There is no such thing as that. So this total, all the numbers on here are starting to get really, really freaky. Also down here, we've got more from the infiltration. This is just humidity gain, 13,000. And then we've got internal loads um, from people, which by the way, when you're doing humidity, humidity adds 200 BTUs per hour from each person. And then the heat that's coming from each person is 230. So I, they got that a little bit mixed up, but it's like, okay, that's interesting. Um, so over here, we can see these design conditions. They did not, interestingly, mess with the design temperatures that we're aiming at. Those are the 99% coldest and 99% hottest uh, temperatures that we've got. So that's good. Um, but the heat loss, they've got one air change per hour, which I don't even know what this winter CFM really means. Is that saying that there's one air change complete from outside? That would explain that six tons of... Uh, cooling that we're going to need. So the winter CFM 1200, again, I have no idea what this means. Like these are not numbers that are normally used, um, to express this stuff. So, um, when we look at the other, it's the second floor, same thing, basically we've got also, they adjusted the temperatures slightly. So they did here actually, okay, I'm sorry. I did not mark it over here, but I did here. You can look this up in manual J there's a table it's, it's in the appendix what temperatures you should be designing at. Instead of 22, it's really 23. That's not a big difference. But instead of 100, it's actually 91. That is a big difference. And that is going to make a big ding in the cooling needed. So that's another part of why they're overestimating this. And then as you can see down here, this designer spec 11 tons of cooling for what they said is a 7,600 square foot home. That's 690 square foot per ton. If you just divide it out, that's a very simple math. And what my type of client, which this guy is my type of client, he's using a uh, air sealing technique, which in this case is zip system. This is a sheathing that can be taped at the seams. Conditioned attic with spray foam. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that he's trying to do. Ventilation, makeup air, using an ERV instead of bath fans, et cetera, et cetera. So there really, we're looking at more like 1200 to 2500 square feet per ton. I actually just did one the other day that was ended up being 3900 square feet per ton. So this guy had a 6000 square foot house and he has a ton and a half air conditioner is all he needs. Um, that that was kind of an extreme case, but I just want to show you what the way that you do this and I don't know how else you'd do this is that you build a 3D model. For a house this complicated and by the way this is one of I've had a couple of them lately, but one of the most complicated 3D models I've ever had to build. You can see all of these roof, these attic sections need to be separated out into their own systems. And each of the interior rooms there needs to be put together. Then we need to layer them on top of each other to see what exposed floor area there is. So all that stuff is really, this is like why it takes so long to do it the right way, which again, I have my clients tell me that this is an advanced manual, Jay, what I do. I think it's basic. Um, I think this is how everybody should be doing it, but I don't know how everybody else is doing it if they're not using something like SketchUp. So here is the real corrected manual J that I re-ran for him. And this is often what happens. We can do two things. I can either make a bunch of notes in the redlined version of the designer's calc, which in this case, I didn't even know what to say. I was just like, this is crazy. Like, I don't, I don't know what to suggest because there's no information here. And the information that's here is like really confusing. So we can then give those notes to your designer and expect that one of two things will happen. They'll either say, uh, screw you. I'm never talking to you again. And you, now you have to find another HVAC contractor or they'll say, oh, great. 
I love constructive criticism. Please, let's, let's have a conversation about this. I want to get this right for you. Um, the number of people who would do that second option is less than what you would hope for. But uh, essentially, the other option, aside from creative uh, ways to get critique across and have the thing be corrected by the HVAC designer is to just redo it from the ground up, which is what I did here. So you can see that we redid it. The um, temperatures actually ended up being uh, uh, the same as what they had put. Sorry, I'm still redacting this thing. So 22 degrees, 99 degrees um, is what it ended up being in this particular part of Texas. So I was wrong about that when I first uh, was consulting with the the um, first design calc, and that is partly because there are not weather stations everywhere that are Manual J approved. When you look up the Manual J side of things, it'll have weather stations that are like around what you're looking for, but if there's one that's better, they might have different numbers, and so that's why there's a discrepancy there. But you can see here what my software thinks this house is is not 7,600 square feet. It thinks this house is 16,000 square feet because it's got 200,000 cubic feet of air in it. And 200,000 divided by the uh, ceiling height that it's used to, which is eight feet, gives you this new square footage that is, is a weird one. Um, and so what they really need is right down here. You can see that we've got 85% cooling, 15% drying needed. Um, this is the, the um, number of uh, BTUs per hour, 133,000. BTUs per hour of heat that this home needs. That we'll put to the side. But right here, 85% cooling, 15% drying. This is called sensible latent split. This number right here, 6.16, is really what you want to use because that is based on sensible plus latent. This number, which I hate that they include at all, 7.01 tons, Totally disregard because it is based on 75% sensible capacity, which we don't have. We have 85%. So you can just ignore this. If your software and it's WriteSoft and Elite both do this for some reason, they say, hey, just in case you want a different number, here's a different number. I think it's like an excuse for oversizing this stuff. So really 6.16 tons, which could be done by a, um, possibly, by a six ton unit, more likely a six and a half tons of air conditioning. There's no such thing as a six ton unit. By the way, you're looking at a three out of three or a two and a four or whatever it is. So that's just an example of um, why you really wanna get detailed because the more you drift off course, changing things like design temperatures, changing the square footages, getting things just a little bit off, um, not putting the right number of people into it, all those things are gonna make a big difference and it should just get bigger and bigger and bigger until the, you're like, not even in the same neighborhood as where you should be. So please use the tools that are available. SketchUp, very easy. I'm linking a video on screen on how I use SketchUp. It's a half an hour like course on for HERS Raiders, which I used to be one of, um, on how to use this thing. Use the Manual J software the way that Manual J was written to be used. Put your infiltration in there. Again, there's a video about how to select the right uh, air leakage for your, uh, your inputs. Um, that I'm linking on screen now as well. Comment below if you have anything to add, questions as well. I address those personally. Like and subscribe. Tune in next time.